In the early days of the automobile, the rule seemed to be the bigger the better. But as those cars kept guzzling gas, fuel prices shot up, causing drivers to rethink the size of their vehicles. Under pressure, Detroit responded, shrinking cars down to fun size. Yes, like the little Halloween candy bars. This is their story. And the man to tell it is the Henry Ford Museum's curator of transportation, Matt Anderson. He loves any car, big or small. Right now I'm sitting in the driver's seat of a 1977 Ford Mustang II. The Mustang II is actually a full 19 inches shorter than its previous model year. And for that matter, it's seven inches shorter than the original 1965 Mustang. The classic 65 Mustang was called a pony car for its sporty look and the sense of freedom it gave drivers. But it was built on the chassis of a Ford Falcon, a compact car. When do we start seeing compact cars? We start to see compact cars on American roads in the 1950s. In the 1950s, but this is the time of prosperity. I always associate compact cars with the energy crisis in the 70s. In a way, that prosperity was a reason for compact cars. A lot of Americans now were moving out to the suburbs. They were looking for a second car. So it made sense maybe to buy something a little smaller just to go to work or to run errands. And what was an example of an early one? This car right here is a 1950 Nash Rambler. It's considered the first modern compact car. And it's a beautiful car. It doesn't look like a cheapo kind of. For ages, Americans thought small car meant cheap car. So when Rambler was introduced, uh, the company went to great pains to make sure that this was a quality vehicle. So you've got white wall tires, you've got the fender skirts, you've got an optional AM radio. It had the goods. It wasn't just a small car. This doesn't look that compact. No, it's pretty large by today's standards, but that was the selling point for the Rambler, that it was a shorter wheelbase. The distance between the front and the rear wheels, much smaller than other cars of the time, but it didn't have a whole lot of overhang in the front or the back. So you got the most space out of the interior of the car, yet you had something that was very small, easy to maneuver, and got great gas mileage, too. How long before the big three, Chrysler, Ford, and General Motors, got into the compact car business? They kind of sit out through most of the 50s, letting smaller car makers handle that market. But in the late 50s, we had an economic recession and people started to think about gas mileage again seriously. And in the 1960 model year, you have compacts from Ford, from Plymouth, and from Chevrolet all at once. And let's not forget the dent Germany made in the US with its uber successful Volkswagen Beetle. But it would take a global crisis to get car buyers to fully embrace the compact. Now this over here, this is the compact car I think about when I think of the energy crisis, right? Yeah, and uh, compacts kind of faded away through the 60s. People went back toward larger cars. All of that changes almost overnight with the oil crisis in 1973. By 1974, more than half the new cars sold in the US are compact. Question is, have we learned anything from the past? After the fuel crisis, compacts were something like 50% of the market. Now they're closer to 13, maybe 15% of the market. That's it? The good news is that a lot of our larger cars, even SUVs, are getting much better fuel economy than they did even 15, 20 years ago. And I have to say, some of those cars are so ugly, they're kind of beautiful. Yeah, they could afford to take chances with styling that I don't think the big three would. So it made the cars memorable. That was the whole point. You go, Matt. You go.